Ed Marks here. Welcome to another episode of Ed Talks. In this episode, I have a friend of mine, Joe DeLuca, who's joined us. Joe, welcome to Ed Talks. Uh, thank you. Happy to be here. Thank you for having me on today. Yeah, we're going to talk about a lot of things from an advisor investor point of view. You've had a, an amazing career, still do, and want to get some of your insights as an investor, as an advisor, and, and just all, all the time that you've been in the industry. And we've known each other for quite some time. I don't know the exact date and time that we actually met, but we've both been in the industry for a while. So we've we've uh, bumped into each other uh, here and there. And so that's why I wanted you- yeah, that's The battle scars. Yeah, definitely the battle scars and the loss of hair. <laughs> uh, but before we get going, just kind of setting things up a little bit, What's the best customer experience you've had, let's say this year? So in, uh, it's, a, it's an interesting question because as you pointed out, um, I work both on sort of the small, mid-sized company investment side, as well as on the health system side. And I'd like to talk about how those come together. So I'm gonna give you an example of both. Yeah. Um, so on the, on the um, sort of the investor side has an operating partner, where we come in and help a small mid-sized company grow. Um, we help the company take a, a very small but very significant uh, technology product, text-based text marketing product that was designed to help high volume recruiting in areas like home and community-based services, where it's a very difficult market. You're competing with Amazon. People expect immediate results. They send in my application. I want the job now. Can I start tomorrow? Um, and the novelty of this was, one, the technology, but two, the funding sources. It was largely grant funded, um, which was great because there was a whole evaluation process, but it also provided a legitimacy to the health systems that well, to the large commercial organizations that were, were going to use it. And it was just it was a tremendous amount of fun. Um, the programmers were from uh, Costa Rica. Um, so it was sort of an interesting international dynamic. Yeah. So it grew a team culture that way. So that that was probably that was a very good one. The other one, it's a little bit dated, a little bit um, wasn't just this year, but it, it went back. We went in, and I specifically went in and has a uh, side by side uh, interim CIO, I'll call it, to a very large um, home and community based system, healthcare provider, um, hospice care. 100,000 patients under management every day, 35,000 employees, and a train wreck mm -hmm. of an IT department. And the reason why it was intriguing, and we had to think, I had to think, outside of the normal scope of how do you get this stuff done? We had to rebuild 120 agencies, their, their communications network, um, in three months. So all of a sudden we were thinking things that like, okay, we, we got a company to do a network in a box. So you ship it out, they open it up, they fire it up and the office administrator all of a sudden has a new local area network with no on-site support. Yes. But you and I both know from the traditional health system environment, you wouldn't think that way. No. You would think of a team that's going to go out, you're going to do the pre-assessment, right. all this kind of stuff. And and we we broke it broke it down into components, and it was very um, rewarding in the sense of getting to the endpoint. This company was just recently uh, acquired, um, and seeing at the end of the project, six seven months, I think it was maybe even longer, um, seeing the satisfaction scores um, go up on IT and services as opposed to where they were yeah. going. Before. So, so I'll point those two out. As, yeah, and those those sort of represent both sides of, of the experience of what I provide and we provide as service organizations. Yeah, that's, that's a great example. What's one thing that your parents forced you to do when you were a kid and you're like kind of eye rolling, but as you look back over the course of your life, you're kind of glad they forced it on you. So I'll call it uh, more an expectation. Um, and it was an expectation for education and I'll call it now lifelong learning, lifelong education. So um, coming from a, a traditional um, sort of immigrant family from Italy, uh, so forth, my, my cousins and I were the first in the uh, family to go to formal high school. Hmm. Even though my dad was a World War II vet and 
uh, flew planes. He had no formal education to do that. And he didn't get that. He didn't get his GED till I think I was probably, I was probably 40 when wow. he finally got his that. And then he, he went on to um, sort of do some other educational things, but it was the expectation of education. So that was, and then two of my cousins and I were the first to actually go to, uh, to college other than some vocational training. And one other, Johnny and I became the first to actually get master's degrees. Um, and it was, it's related to another question that, that I'd sort of previewed that you sent out, which who do you find um, inspiration from? So when I look back on that, behind that expectation from my parents was the expectation from the families who emigrated from Italy to here for a better life, for a, a better purpose, for a non-agrarian kind of, you could say we're basically right. farmers in, in Southern Italy. Um, and I often kind of look back and kind of go, what would they say today? You know, have we achieved what that dream was? Um, and that's inspirational. Yeah, no, absolutely it is. And I forget the exact stat, but it's something like out of all the new millionaires that are made, it's well over, Again, I don't want to fact check her because I, I don't remember the exact stat, but it, I recall it being like 70 or 80 percent of new millionaires are immigrants because they come over like your parents, like, wow, what an opportunity. And let's do something. And my parents are the same way. So that that's yeah. really cool. So let's talk about your career a little bit. It's it's quite vast and you've had several different roles. What Can you share like maybe one role that that has been the most informative that sort of helped shape? who you are today? Um, absolutely. So and I want to actually do two, one that's sort of uh, formal and one that's less formal. So the, the formal ones were actually going back to my, my graduate school days at the University of Wisconsin-Madison um, and the research that if you have you've gone through my LinkedIn profile, I talk a lot about what we did in advancing um, it, the assessment of, of critical care patients and using that to help. At the time, there was no helicopter transport, no EMTs, this is going back to 1978, but using that to help get those programs in and then going out and helping to get rural facilities to just say, you know what, a, a patient coming in with a burn needs fluids and the doctor doesn't need there to be there for the nurse to assess that and yeah. get that, get that uh, line going, if you will. So, so sort of going back to those days, is I had that role, and then I also simultaneously had it work my way through grad school, had a role where I was running uh, the data processing department for a mental, ho mental health hospital, Mendota Mental Health Facility. Um, so let me go to those two. First off, I had two fantastic mentors helping me through that, one on the research side, one on the operations side. Um, and what I learned very early on, I mean, I, I was green. I mean, I'm kind of like, they put me in charge of these things. And I'm like, me? Uh, my, my boss at Mendona Mental Health Institute, Lee Eklund, rest in peace, literally said, you've got data processing. It's in the basement someplace. Uh, follow the stairs down and come back and tell me what you need uh, wow. to get the job done. So it was incredible. But what I learned from both of those experiences was stay close to the patient, stay close to the customer because each of those forced me to very early on in my career see the impact of what we could do with technology as it was at the time, whether it was in an evaluation phase, which then led to process improvement in the EMS systems um, and career improvement relative to what nurses and EMTs could do. And in the mental health side, somewhat the same, though a little bit more complex. I also had the privilege at that time of getting to know uh, Judy Faulkner um, and was one of the first customers at Mendota Mental Health. It was actually not Epic at the time, it was Human Resources Computing Inc. And starting to learn, she had a, an early on perspective of staying close to the customer, how do you design for a specific need? Um, so I would say those from the formal perspective, and I've just carried those all through my career. And if I wouldn't have had those, I think I would have got there, but it probably would have taken me a, a job cycle or maybe yeah. five years to get that sort of into my DNA. Uh, the other thing that, that I would say relative to the roles, 
Um, and it's not formal, but my entire life has been about being an educator. So no matter what I do, um, and I've been privileged to be uh, a faculty at the American College of Healthcare Executives 15 or more times, written several books. Uh, but when I go out, work with boards, you do the same. Yeah. You know, you're there to help advance, uh, not just what we're talking about, but advance how you think about the world of information services or uh, the applied processes that might be around it. And, and I actually do that has uh, sort of a great achievement or achievement over over my career, just the privilege of being able to to do that and come forward with it. Uh, when I first started uh, standing in front of ACHG back in 82, 83 ish, um, it's in front of a world you know, group of CEOs and their basic questions were, what should we be spending? How do I understand the technology? How do I how do I um, trust the leader that I have in front of me. And one of the things I used to say is, still do somewhat, you sit on top of complex imaging technology, complex care delivery systems. You're not an expert in those, but you follow your instinct yeah. on those. Um, do the same with IT. It's it's no different. Yeah, that, that's a well, well stated. And yeah, it's always nice when you, given the sort of opportunities that you were describing early in your career, where you may feel like you're in over your head and are, but it, it's rapid learning that helps shape, you know, the rest of your career. That's really cool. So today I, you're, you're still doing a lot of different things, but two areas that you're particularly uh, spending a lot of time on, one is healthcare investment visions, which is like a PE, and then also the IT optimizers company. So I wanted to just ask a question about each. So what what's it like, you know, as an operating partner with healthcare investment visions, you know, what, what do you do and what kind of companies are you helping with? So um, we, we, as an aside, we do, we're sort of a little bit like a private equity firm, but we don't actually have a fund or invest. So on the, the healthcare investment vision side, um, we will have early mid-stage, pretty much pre-series A to post-series A companies come forward. And to oversimplify it, um, we I solve problems and create opportunities. So we'll get approached by a company that's um, either performing well, but they want to grow faster. So we'll pick up a particular program management area. Um, they tend to not be in any of the core technology areas you and I might think about that a health system would look at, forward-facing consumer technologies in health, uh, digital therapeutics, hot right now. Uh, digital mental health was, was hot, sort of cooling off. Um, but generally a focus on increasing access um, and increasing the efficacy of the care processes that we seem to be down, down a path like that right now. Although in the past, it's been, if, if you go back onto, um, onto my resume and LinkedIn, like Gobaldo, uh, which was a, a um, clinical trials accelerator, was one that we worked with eventually. It got sold to, to Oracle. Um, so those are the kinds of things that we work through. So we're, we're either helping them grow um, or we're helping them get out of a problem that might be there. And then there's a range of things that have to occur behind that. Um, help do product design, uh, help do some form of growth relative to scalability that might be there. The IT optimizer side, I'm sorry, go ahead. You yeah, ask a question. You know, I, you know, it's super fascinating and, and you can definitely see how, especially when, when maybe it's a startup or early stage company, they don't have the breadth and depth of experience of someone like yourself, and you're able to provide this uh, insight and help, like the examples you were given in early in your jobs in your career, you can help accelerate right. them. Yeah, tell us about IT optimizers. And if I, I'll do that in a um, So in a lot of those companies also have first time entrepreneurs in place. And I, you know, I mean, you can see the companies have built and sold before. So just haven't yeah. been through the process before often is coming. So IT optimizers, um, so that works with health systems, health payers, 80% uh, of what the company does is provision of interim CIO, CTO roles, um, and sort of program managers of scale. So really comes in the, to help go through transitions for organizations, could be two organizations that are merging. We got put in a, someone, yeah. an interim CIO, you've been there, uh, to just sort of figure it out along the road. Um, and then the other 20% is generally focused on strategic planning, 
uh, feasibility analysis, certain levels of, of product procurements that might be going on, uh, and turnaround efforts um, that that sometimes exist. One of the ones we did recently was a merger of, and this was a merger of two large health systems where we basically had to come in and right size the organizations, do all the locking and tackling that's along the way. But where they intersect is in the area of understanding needs and requirements. So if I'm out on the private equity side, if you will, and we're trying to validate an MVP, a minimum viable product or uh, a, a business case for a product, we don't have to go out and do some form of a large study for that. We can get colleagues like you involved, who we know on the health system side or the health payer side to basically come in and sit around the table and kind of go, yes, no, maybe on yeah. the product. Uh, that's that's our intersection point. One thing to the, to the listeners out there that we don't do, um, and we put a practice barrier around this is on the health system private equity side, we do nothing on the sales side on it. So we don't want to uh, contaminate a view to a CIO or an executive team that we're there to sell a product. Right. Into yeah, no, that's pretty cool. It's, and, and again, it goes back to taking advantage of someone who's had a lot of different experiences and the battle scars to show for it and really help accelerate their processes, watch out for the gotchas. Uh, there's no reason to learn the hard way when you have someone you know, helping them. One, one of the things that I'm becoming um, pleasantly aware of, so back in back in my early days, um, there was, a, and I was working with Arthur Anderson, the division that now is Accenture. One of my partners, John Moga in Seattle, may he rests in peace, um, often said early on, you know, these hospitals we work with, they don't have any R&D budgets. They don't have any innovation, we would say today. And now I look, I was just down at a conference where Sara from, from uh, Providence was talking in that conference earlier in the year, last year, where the Methodist folks were up there. And now we look at the organizations who want that innovation to come in, are establishing these discipline process processes to look at what's there. So I think some of the, um, I'm trying to think of the right word, but some of the view that you have to be on one side or the other, uh, that you can't cross both, is going away. And I think um, that's part of the role that we end up serving. Yeah, no, that's very cool. So in all of this, yeah, your career, but also in the, your current two companies, uh, a lot of it has to do with leadership. So curious, what would you share, Joe, with someone earlier in the career? You know, um, you know, they just graduated, maybe they're in their first or maybe second job. What are some, what's one, what's one nugget of wisdom you would give them in terms of early career and how to grow? Uh, <laughs> Understand your own emotional intelligence quotient. Um, that's the fancy word for it, but it's, it's basically a different way of learning who you are yeah. um, and what motivates you and how you can self-reflect and learn from that introspection, um, which then takes you out to find your, um, your leadership co-pilots, if you will, that are out there both in the career path and very critically in life in general. And those are gonna, those are gonna intersect, obviously. Yeah. Uh, but I think it's a really um, underscore, underscored, it's, it's a really underestimated personal characteristic that people have to have. And then relates to understanding your EQ, relates to some form of a life model. And there's tons of them out there, uh, but some form of a life model that integrates it's in and puts together what's my my life purpose and passion alongside what are my skills and my emotional abilities to to manage that yeah no that's that's, that's great advice where do you go to grow and get inspired what do you what do you do um so it's interesting that <laughs> this week i was with uh, a career long colleague um, who literally I've known since 1982, 83, and we, we were just talking about this and came to a conclusion that um, I go back to people I trust and people who have helped me through good times and bad times. Yeah. Um, and he's yeah. certainly one, uh, my family and, and um, wife, certainly. Um, and then this is going to sound really weird, but I also go back to 
memories. So I think back, we were talking earlier about what would my grandparents think yeah. about that right now. And whenever I have an uh, HR problem I'm dealing with, I had a really good friend up in Seattle who sadly uh, uh, died in a car accident. I kind of often think, what would she do? Because she had guided me on principles rather than specifics along the way. Um, so some people find the inspiration through their faith, through the church, and that can certainly be, should be a part of it if that's part of, of your life goal. But that's where I go for yeah. my inspiration. I like that. So Joe, we covered a lot of ground and really interesting from your personal story and going all the way back, you know, multiple generations and then taking those, you didn't call them risks, but took, taking some early uh, career opportunities and uh, <laughs> risks that help you grow and, and really accelerate. Right. And a little bit about your current companies and some of your leadership philosophies. What did we miss or anything you want to double down on? I'll give you the last word. Sure. Um, so I would like to double down to the audience on um, making um, your your actions, I'm trying to be the right word, real or meaningful for the environments that you're in. Right. I think we're going through this hype cycle right now. We're going to transform digital health, going to transform this, going to transform that. Um, and those are great aspirationally, but just take it down a level to something that is meaningful in this quarter, this year, this month for uh, your organization or for what you're trying to achieve. Um, I think I'd, I'd just sort of leave with that. It's a reflection I've been having after looking at some old graduate school papers um, and going, how much have we moved this needle yeah. in healthcare? And um, when you look at it at the macro level, you know, you, you have to kind of question some things as to what's going on. When you look at it at the micro level, we have made very significant adaptations and alterations to the systems that are helping cohorts and groups of populations. And my fear, Ed, is that people start to get at this higher level and in some form they feel defeatist about yeah. it. So I'd say find that little niche and live with it and ride it. Yeah, no, that's very well said. Joe, thanks for sharing. You know, it's not often that we get to hear from established leaders that are willing to be transparent and authentic and, and share from their heart. So I really appreciate you being a guest on this episode of Ed Talks. Uh, thank you. I much appreciate the opportunity and always here to give back.